This is SFNet Presents In The Know with host Barry Bobro, sponsored by Hilco Global. Well, welcome everybody to the next episode of the world famous podcast, SFNet Presents In The Know. I'm your world famous host, Barry Bobro. <laughs> I'm gonna get some grief for that, I'm sure. Uh, for this episode, and for loyal fans of the podcast, you'll remember that in episode three, we did a very deep dive market update with Maria DeCaos of Refinitiv. And it's hard to believe, but another quarter has come and gone. We have third quarter information, and I really wanted to get back to market update. So I asked Maria to join me again. And uh, we both, both Maria and I wanted to include in this episode uh, a much deeper dive on the private debt, the direct lending business. And so Maria included her good friend and colleague, CJ Doherty. So let's bring them on. Great. Maria, mm -hmm. CJ, welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Barry. Great. Um, uh, in case everybody doesn't remember, maybe Maria and CJ, you can just take a minute and talk a little bit about what you do at Refinitiv so everybody has a, some level set on, on why you're the experts. Sure. Um, so I am head of Global Loans Contributions at Refinitiv LPC, which basically means I am um, engaged in uh, the market to collect and vet and um, review our data and um, I also work on analysis um, on uh, regarding the, the loan market. Yeah, and I'm director of analysis at Refinitiv LPC, and I focus on the private debt and leveraged loan markets. Um, and basically, I produce reports, you know, write some articles, participate in our conferences and podcasts as well. And I've been doing this uh, now for well over 20 years. Thanks, guys. Well, thanks, thanks again for joining. Uh, just a footnote for people who are listening and not watching, we have a very extensive slide deck, uh, which will be made available on the SFNet website if you uh, if you want to download it. But uh, we're going to talk along, we're going to try to describe what's on the slides as we go. But my best advice is you should either watch it with the slides up in front of you or download them so that you can uh, get the, the benefit of all of the good work from Maria and CJ. Let's, uh, let's go to the slides here. Let's bring those those up. Uh, Maria, you want to take us through slide three, which is really sure. the, the outlook of uh, U.S. leverage loan and bond issuance. Right. So I think um, the, the, t the key takeaway in, in the third quarter is that many of the challenging market conditions that we talked about last quarter um, in, you know, that was impacting the buy side, the sell side shops, they're no longer um, just sort of undefinable market strains or or limited to uh, specific issuers. I think the market as a whole moved more squarely into bearish territory. And we see this in the in, in the charts. In the left hand chart, you know, at a high level, US syndicated loan volume was down 24% um, year over year in the third quarter to log the weakest quarterly results in almost two years. And despite any hopes of a post Labor Day uptick in deal flow, the headlines that we've observed around inflation, um, concerns about a possible hard landing, um, strained energy supplies as we're heading into the winter, and just generally the more hawkish um, tone coming out of the, the the Federal Reserve, they all came together and and. Um, reinforced a more cautionary market stance among both borrowers and lenders. So um, against this backdrop, nevertheless, liquidity remained largely in place, but it became a lot more precious. And um, with the June release of the Fed's stress test, um, you know, several lenders faced the need to increase their capital buffers. So everyone was a lot more mindful and and deals were a lot more scrutinized. And, and I think that the very important point in the third quarter is that some of the relative value plays that we were discussing last quarter, where lenders, um, you know, often bypass the primary market to buy, you know, sort of cheaply available quality assets in the secondary market with the hope of riding the credits up, that did not carry in the third quarter because we saw, you know, bids, um, 
uh, sort of rebounded briefly. Um, but on the whole, as of September, they've been down. So it's it's still a very unsettled market and, and it's edged more towards um, uh, kind of parking itself in bearish uh, yeah, territory. the market the the market sort of capitulated. Hope was yeah. hope was still there at the end of Q two, but by the end of Q three, exactly, uh, exactly. people had settled yeah. in. You know, very yeah. interesting. Uh, and then we go to slide four, which uh, talks about your point on liquidity, which re- looks okay, but definitely uh, su- substantial outflows. Yeah, there, Barry, there, there's a couple of different things going on here. Um, the chart on the left looks at uh, retail loan fund flows, and the chart on the right looks at CL. And what we're seeing there, I guess, is broadly speaking, two different dynamics uh, in recent times. Uh, if you look at the loan flows, you'll see that in the first four months of the year, there was very strong inflows. Uh, you know, that's back, back at that time, there was a lot of uh, the expectation of higher rates for loans was was a good thing. Um, and so we saw a lot of money flow in. And then starting in May, when it became clear that inflation wasn't going away um, and that there was more concerns around the economy, uh, basically, outflows, large-scale outflows have started, and and just to put some numbers on that, in the first four months we saw inflows of 25 billion, but subsequently we've seen outflows now of about 20, 29 billion since May. So so a real reversal. Um, so that's kind of been more of a, I guess, a negative for the market. Um, slightly more positive CLO issuance, the, the biggest buyers of you know institutional leveraged loans. It's been a really good year in in many ways. Um, issuance is about 113 billion. Um, you know, that's down quite a bit from last year when it was over 140 billion at this point. Uh, but at the same time, last year was a record year. So overall, it's been a pretty, you know, robust year in terms of issuance. Uh, that said, it's really kind of, you know, in October where we started to see a little bit of a slowdown. Um, there was some impediments there. Um, just to give you three of them, uh, basically, you know, U.S. banks pulled back a bit from from buying AAA paper. Uh, there was also a pullback from Norichuken, the Japanese uh, AAA investor. And then you might have seen in the press as well that over in the UK, uh, some of the pension funds were selling CLOs because they had to uh, raise capital for collateral calls. So overall, uh, you know, some some impediments there. And thus we saw, you know, we've seen AAA spreads um, increase quite substantially. Um, and just I would say, just finally on this, just looking ahead to next year, uh, JP Morgan recently came out with their forecast for next year, an, an early one, um, issuing or expecting about 100 billion of issuance. So, you know, not as much as last year, not as much as this year, but but still not too shabby overall. Oh, great, great. Interesting. I mean, just the, the idea that the globalization, that uh, the events in Japan uh, and the UK deeply affecting the US leverage loan market, that's uh, that's that's a big story. So let's look at look at the next slide here. This is this is survey data. I'll let one of you guys tackle uh, uh, explain to us what's going on with the uh, with with your own survey. Sure. Um, so um, as you noted, these are our survey results, and I think that they um, basically mirror some of the nervousness or or um, uncertainty that that we were talking about. Um, I think in this slide, um, basically what we we see, the key takeaways are that, you know, risk aversion comes hand in hand with uncertainty. So over 80% of the respondents to our survey indicated that they expected to see more lender caution and increased risk aversion. Um, and, and this is just reinforced by the fact that um, in the leverage space, the overhang of underwritten deals, which, you know, had to come to market, work their way through, um, cast a really long shadow. And I think we we see that in, uh, it might be the, the next slide, Barry, but just sticking with this one for the moment, I think um, that... The, the market as a whole, lenders as a whole, um, you know, largely expected a more quiet half on the one hand um, in the second half of the year. But I think it was caught a bit off guard with how quiet it actually got. And, and we're going to talk about um, the direct lender market specifically. Um, but I do think it's important to note that the reality check um, that sort of impacted the debt capital markets in the third quarter 
also touched the direct lender market mm -hmm. despite its robust growth and its positioning as a meaningful liquidity provider in in the leverage and, space. and interestingly too the direct lending has a more stable funding base but it's still yep. it was still affected by the relative value and we'll we'll see that coming up here yeah. Just, uh, yeah i don't know if you had any other comments on slide six which is a bunch well, of I think, points from your yeah survey. right i think it's it's a bunch of bullet points um definitely don't want to belabor them but i think that the the key note is that as I mentioned before, the, the hope was that once the backlog in the leveraged loan market was cleared, um, and it was not an unmanageable backlog, it was not, you know, egregiously large by historical levels, um, that that there would uh, be momentum to start building up the pipeline again. And and we really didn't see that. And mm -hmm. we and, and based on discussions with lenders, they don't sense that. And that's basically because it's become so difficult to price and, and just kind of gauge where the market's going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we don't have a slide on it, but the, the M&A activity is is dramatically lower for the same reason. Yeah. Just uncertainty over economic direction uh, uh, leading to less deal flow to be financed. Yep. Um, uh, we have a on slide seven. We have a, a pricing slide, which I mean, that's a that's a definition of a hockey stick. I think normally, right, right, exactly. And and I think again, it's just a testament to, you know, how do you double down as a lender and say we're open for business. We 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 want to finance your deals, even if you do when when there's that uncertainty around where pricing is going to go and what can clear the market um and and if you underwrite today can you um syndicate it even a short while later so um yeah i think that that's just yeah and this is this chart is a combination of it's the absolute level of pricing so it's a combination of credit spreads expanding and the underlying yeah. SOFR going up which is uh been yep. uh, you know dramatic Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and just to add in another point on that as well, it's the OIDs, uh, which have got really, really um, are really deep these days. And, you know, just to give you a couple of examples as well, the Citrix deal, which came out, um, you know, not that long ago, its OID was 91. Covetris, another one was 94 cents on the dollar. And, uh, and even just this week, uh, Tenneco is, uh, is coming to market and it's being talked in the 84 to 85 area mm -hmm. for an OID. So, so really deep. So deals that were mispriced by today's standards, finding a home, but only at a, at a deep discount. Thanks, CJ. All right. So CJ, we're getting to your sweet spot here, which is direct <laughs> lending. So I'm going to let you drive starting, I guess, on page nine. Sure. Thanks, Barry. Um, yeah. So just wanted to start with uh, direct lending and, and private debt. And I think we all know it's been talked about a lot that private debt has grown dramatically in recent years. Uh, you know, there's been lots of money flowing in. In turn, and then it, people always ask, well, how big is this market? And to be honest, there's no real uh, transparency. There's a lot of estimates out there and they vary widely. Some people say a trillion, others say 1.3 trillion, 1.5. The one part of the market though, where we do have transparency, which we do track uh, is the, the BDC part of the market. They're just a piece of it, but at the same time, it kind of here we can just see in the chart that the growth, uh, and they've actually grown dramatically as well in recent years, and now top 250 billion of assets under management. Um, and just kind, of, I think an interesting point is that the recent growth has been driven by the the growth of perpetual life BDCs. Um, they just came on stream early last year, so they went from basically zero to about to over 75 billion of AUM uh, since then. Uh, and the biggest one, just to name one, is the Blackstone Private Credit Fund, which is now about 50 billion of assets. It was kind of the, the first mover and it's really grown, uh, but there's others coming on stream as well. Great. Um, and just, yeah, the next slide, Ben, it's kind of the same theme, it kind of uh, in terms of growth and fundraising. Uh, this looks at middle market direct lending fundraising. And what we've seen is that through the first nine months, it's been a really strong year. Uh, 123 billion of issuance, and that actually tops what we saw last year when there was uh, 115 billion in the same period. That said, um, you know things have started to change a little bit. The the fundraising was softer um, in the third quarter, and uh, you know we are hearing that LPs they're they're being more selective now. They're downsizing checks and they're limiting managers. Uh, and also another factor I think kind of impacting fundraising these days is the strength of the dollar. 
uh, is making it less attractive for some uh, international investors. And uh, secondly, we've, we've also heard that some banks are, are you know, not as willing or it's a, a bit harder to get leverage from them uh, for, for new funds. Got it. Yeah, so, so that was kind of growth and fundraising. Now, just to talk a little bit about, so what have we actually seen in terms of uh, deals and, and, and loan issuance? Um, and what we see here is that it really has been a tale of two markets when we look at, at the middle market and we looked at direct um, and, and syndicated lending. And I should have said, it's actually, it's not just middle market, it's middle market sponsored activity. Um, and what we saw was that on the syndicated side, you know, it's it's down 40, it was down 47% in the third quarter, down about 30% uh, year to date. Um, however, it's the other way for direct lenders where we've seen activity there climb 17% in the third quarter, uh, and it's up a similar amount year to date. So it's been, you know, it's, you know, despite the volatility in the wider markets, we've definitely seen uh, you know, strong direct lending activity. Um, I would just caveat a little bit now, though, does that just in recent weeks from what we're hearing is that things have turned more cautious, more selective. Um, so some lenders are saying, you know, we they don't expect fourth quarter activity to be as much as the third quarter. There's a bit more of a, a I think, a revaluation of, of the market going on at the moment. But it makes sense, CJ. I mean, if you have a uh, the private debt dynamic of there, there was money and there was leverage in place and they, they stepped into the void and had a very active period as the syndicated markets, the broadly syndicated markets fell off. Now you have a situation where fundraising is more challenging, as you said, and the, uh, uh, the, the relative value uh, is, is more difficult to, to get comfortable with and banks are pulling back on leverage. And so capital becomes scarce in the, in the direct lending world, maybe not because of outflows, but it's still a it's still a scarce commodity, and so you wouldn't you wouldn't be surprised to see more caution and maybe a flight to quality and, and looking for better yield all at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I guess the direct lending market can't you know operate independently of everything else in the world, so uh, that's definitely a, a very fair point. Yeah, uh, and just to sort of drive it home, uh, slide twelve talks about the 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 market share, I guess, of of direct versus uh, versus broadly syndicated. Yeah, exactly. And this kind of looks through the first uh, nine months of the year. So doesn't take into account kind of that that bit of a change that we've heard in the market recently. Um, the chart on the left looks at, uh, you know, uh, middle market sponsored volume on a quarterly basis. And what we see is that direct, direct lending share basically hit new heights in the third quarter. Um, you know, there was a record, you know, over four times more direct lending in the sponsored middle market than in, than was uh, than in the syndicated market. And, and the chart on the right is the same thing, but it just looks at it on an, on an annual basis. And what we see is the trend has been, you know, just generally in recent years has been mostly up and, and it kind of hit new heights in the uh, in the third quarter as well. And I would just um, add here that if we were to look at LBO specific activity, it would even be uh, a bit higher. Mm -hmm. It would be about 3.6 times. So, yeah. so d definite growth in uh, market share for direct lenders. Right. And, and what you're doing, I, I think, is you're, you're just to go to the top. You're saying it's a hard market to know exactly how big it is, but look at these components of it and look at what's going on within them. And I think Unitronch is the other one that you uh, shows up on page 13. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and Unitronch is like a, a good illustration of the growth, not just in the middle market, which we just discussed, but also in the large corporate market. Um, because basically what we saw was that in the um, – in the in the middle market, it was the um, third busiest quarter for Unitronch lending, um, and the, and in the large corporate market, it was the fourth largest um, quarter in the third quarter. So uh, it just kind of showed kind of the 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 strength of the activity uh, for like lend, direct lenders in both the uh, the middle market and the large corporate market. And if you actually go on to the next chart, I, I think this is um, quite interesting as well. So um, this is basically a list of the largest Unitronish financings, the largest 45 historically. And, and what we saw um, in the third quarter is that eight of them, uh, or sorry, eight of the 45, uh, you know, were, were issued in the, in the third quarter. And I've highlighted those in red in, in this uh, table. Um, but an additional 10 were in the second quarter. So that's 18 out of the largest 45 unit tranches that we've seen in the second and third quarters when there was kind of a lot of volatility in the wider market. Yes, you know, some of them might have been in the works before that, but still it was just kind of an indication 
at least through the third quarter of the of the appetite. And um, just one final point as well is that uh, another strong theme we're hearing about at the moment is that uh, direct lenders wanted to take smaller hold levels than they were before, um, but they were still able to get these large deals done. It just required bringing in more direct lenders. But but overall, uh, you get a real sense for the capacity of the market, which is really uh, is striking, actually. I mean, multi-billion dollar deals showing up like their routine at this point. Yeah, it, it, exactly, exactly. And it's it's been the theme, you know, it really, really picked up in in terms of the, um, you know, jumbo unit tranches It really picked up in the second half of last year. And it's kind of persisted since then. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so just want to, um, I guess, finish up here on the direct lending side with three slides and that they all look at different metrics uh, just to shed some light on on what we've seen um, across different ways of looking at the market. And here uh, we look at leverage uh, for all senior and for unit tranche deals. And what we see is that in the third quarter, the, there wasn't that much of a change in leverage. Um, you know, yes, in both segments, leverage is down from where it was in the in the latter part of last year, but there was no major shift. Uh, which I think a lot of people might find surprising. But um, I think the expectation is that leverage will come down more starting this quarter. We'll see it going forward in, 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 um, in, our, in our future stats. Um, and it's just, you know, the fact that, you know, um, interest yeah, you're always in the rearview mirror with the stats. That's the problem. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But I, I think if we were to come back next quarter, we would we would definitely see more of a downturn given, you know, just there's the higher higher base rates and higher interest costs these days. Um, and second uh, set of metrics to look at here is pricing. Um, and, and basically what we see here, similar to what we saw uh, Maria talked about on the large corporate side, uh, on the direct lending side, we saw we've seen uh, a, a real jump in the third quarter. Um, there's different ways of looking at it. Here we look at um, term middle market term loans, including unit tranches. And in the third quarter, we saw pricing jump to about nine and a half percent on average. Um, and that was driven mainly by uh, in the increase in base rates. Um, so that's one of the differences between what we've seen in the direct lending market and the syndicated market is that in the syndicated market, the higher pricing was driven by OIDs and base rates, whereas in the direct lending market thus far, it's been uh, just uh, more base rates. Very good point. And uh, yeah, so just to, to finish up now on the direct lending side, uh, one of the most closely watched metrics these days, uh, you know, given we're in a, a rising rate environment, is that anything related to interest coverage, you know, um, given the fact that, you know, a lot of lenders are trying to gauge to what extent borrowers can uh, can pay their uh, higher costs. Uh, and what we look at here is the average EBITDA to interest ratio um, for middle market sponsored deals. And what we saw, and this is for new deals, and what we saw is that the the ratio fell to 2.8 times in the third quarter from 3.1. So a downward trend, not surprising. And the chart on the right just kind of illustrates how it differs by issuer leverage, and 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 not surprisingly that where where something is levered uh, has been levered, you know, six times or more, the interest coverage ratio is it is a lot lower. In this case, uh, on new deals which had leverage of at least six times, they. Uh, the uh, average ratio was 1.9 times in the third quarter, and, and that was down from the second quarter. So, um, you know, I, I think it's just a, a theme these days that, you know, lenders are, are basically closely looking at the ability of lenders, uh, you know, ability to, to to pay their higher interest costs from their right. uh, from their cash flows. Well, it, you know, it just it CJ, it just seems inevitable that that a higher the increase in the basis, the increase in the interest rate has to have a, a negative impact on the leverage capacity. Uh, and as you said, you haven't seen it yet, but it, it's going to show up, don't you think, in the in the fourth quarter and beyond? A exactly, exactly. Uh, I think that's exactly what we will see in the th in the fourth quarter. Uh, and also, just you know, from speaking to some lenders as well, recently several of them have made the points that you know when deals were done in the last couple of years, uh, they weren't done in anticipation of SOFR or LIBOR hitting like the five percent area. Mm -hmm. So there is expected, I think, to be more stress next year as well. That would have yeah. been the, the the downside scenario, which is now the the base case. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, Maria, let's get to the the really important stuff around asset based lending. <laughs> when we did this at the end of the second quarter, I think both of us said, "Yeah, the volume just can't keep up." But we were both right. wrong. So what happened? Right. It 
stayed incredibly busy. Um, like you said, we talked in the second quarter um, about the record quarterly issuance. And in, in 3Q, we actually saw the second highest quarterly um, uh, volume total at nearly 44 billion. And um, what that did was obviously it, it boosted year to date issuance and the first nine months of, of 2022 marked um, record totals um, uh, in, in terms of ABL volume. So it's it's been incredibly um, impressive. Um, I think, again, like we talked about last uh, quarter, we see that all of this comes in, in combination with a smaller number of deals themselves getting done. So fundamentally what's happening is, you know, deals are getting larger and, and lenders are holding more of them. But um, so it's, it's, it's a little bit of a different dynamic, but it's, it's definitely yeah. very, very impressive. I, I, I see, I mean, it, it, you can't parse it out of the data, but just, just as we said in Q2, some amount of that volume is, is sort of a quirk of the way the data is gathered that you're, you're yeah. capturing SOFR amendments, which might have only included the, the upsized amount, but now because you're touching pricing on SOFR, you've got to include the full amount. But still, the, the, the dollar volume, and you'll have a chart coming up here on the amount of new money, is, right. is stunning. So maybe we should, yep. we should flip to slide uh, 20. Yeah, so um, we saw record new money as you as you sort of referenced in the first nine months of the year. It came in at over thirty one billion dollars, and then there was an additional eighty six billion in refinancings, which were also obviously a, a historic high. Um, but the in the absence of the opportunistic event driven transactions, so in the absence of M and A most of the new money that did come in was via upsizings and add-ons and then a smattering of new issuers that shifted from cash flow to, to ABL, although that last bit is is trickier to um, for us to track. But we know that that that's what fueled the um, the new issuance. Well, and and uh, the, one of the, the couple of key drivers in there, as I talk to people around the market, is uh, Inflation impact on working capital levels, uh, so more working capital be to, to be financed, and that's partly inflation. It's partly uh, supply chain uh, slowdown. But the other, uh, I think, the other thing that that's going on is that the asset based market is still uh, so relatively inexpensive compared to the, yep. all the stuff we were just talking about in the other markets that borrowers are are tapping their uh, their their ABL revolvers, are opening up availability, and they're using them. Yep, yep, and we definitely have a, a slide that that shows that. I think, you know, over time we've definitely talked about how, especially in difficult market environment, ABL is sort of the best game in town for particular credits, for the rating, for certain industries that have viable assets um, to yep. to uh, link up against. So absolutely, yeah. Well, I, I asked you to take a look at it by month because I was yeah. I was so stunned by the the quarterly volume and when you it looks like it's it's decelerated a bit as the quarter yeah. went on. Yeah, I think that that's that's um, right. I think that as as deal flow started to to slow down as the broader became as the broader market became more uncertain or, or skittish, and I think also what you see is as the broader leverage loan market. Um, became a bit more difficult to to execute against, you know, the the ABL components that would have come in partnership with a term loan or with, yep. you know, another leveraged piece couldn't be brought in because the broader financing was not going to get done. So I think that this um, this chart reflects that, especially post um, Labor Day, where we see that little tick down. Great point. Um, and so I'll I'll jump in here because these are a couple of slides we have um, that are coming from the Keybridge study uh, sponsored by SFNet, but they they tell the the story of of um, utilization levels uh, first of all on slide 22. So it, you and what you see is 
the, the, the reported level going from 40.7% to 40, almost 44% amongst the banks, continuing that trend, brings it back to what I would call a historical level. Uh, still not at the peak that happened uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, but significant increase in the, the draw on, on, on the loan portfolios at the same time that the portfolios are increasing. That's a lot of interest income. Uh, the chart on the right uh, gives the utilization for non-bank lenders, which don't have the, um, the same swing as um, uh, there's a number of factors there, but mostly because they don't have access to the broader capital markets as well. But still, the, the utilization level uh, is back up to actually above the historical trend. So borrowers borrowing more is, is happening across the, uh, the universe there. And on the next page, uh, page 23, just again from the Keybridge study, talking about uh, uh, the, 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 the risk level in, in the assets, which while they've ticked up a bit in both criticized and classified reported loans and also the, uh, the non-accruals in the survey, uh, still at very low levels historically. So credit quality is holding it. Right, let's go on to page 24. Uh, Maria, this is the industry breakdown. Right, right. So um, we've seen a couple of minor uh, changes in terms of the industry composition in, in ABL. Um, retail, uh, the retail industry continues to take up a smaller proportion of the ABL pipeline so far this year. It's running at about 17.5% of total issuance, down from 21% at the end of um, 2021. Um, in contrast, I think uh, you know general manufacturing volume has remained resilient. I'm not sure that's altogether surprising. It's increased from about 13.4% of total issuance in 2021 to 17.3% in the first nine um, months of 2022. And I think that the numbers, you know, highlight the stability in the ABL loan market, despite the broader market volatility. Um, yeah. You know, that's not to say that ABL is immune from the turbulence. I don't think it is. But, you know, as I said a little bit earlier, for well-known um, names that are solid credits where the ABL construct um, makes sense, it offers access to incremental um, capital if necessary. And, and not surprising to see the shift. I mean, the industries that are experiencing the, the inventory inflation uh, uh, and the supply chain issues are, are increasing and retail, which is really trying to reduce its inventory is, is shrinking, but that's, that's still one of the largest, if not the largest category in the- yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about pricing on page 25. Yep. Yep. So again, we see that ABL pricing remains really stable, um, um, but not. We don't have the same number of deals pricing at the tighter end of the, of the, uh, spread spectrum as as we did um, last quarter. So just over twenty nine deals. Um, I'm sorry, just over twenty nine percent of deals priced at 125 basis points or 150 basis points over term SOFR. And that's down from 48% at the end of last quarter. So we we certainly know of select names that um, were on the fringes and they struggled to clear the market. But I think that this is, um, especially the chart on the right, sort of highlights the fact that there has been um, despite the fact that average spreads remained relatively stable, the the dispersion did shift, and and we are seeing um, uh, a larger number of deals price a little bit higher. Yeah, and, and anecdotally, uh, and maybe this is similar to what, what CJ and I were talking about earlier, that you'll see more in the Q4. But anecdotally, uh, there is pushback from banks, and it's resulting in some deals not raising as much as they had wanted. Uh, to the borrowers had wanted or, or or possibly having to move pricing a little bit, but it's it hasn't really shown up in the numbers yet, but I, I would think it would, given the way that banks are, are, uh, are treating yeah. capital in the current environment. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's right. Uh, and this, this is the, this is always my favorite chart. It just shows you what a great bargain ABL is for issuers with similar ratings. Right. Right, I think, and 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 you referenced that um, a, a bit earlier. I think that for uh, issuers that um, can 
implement an ABL structure given the, you know, the credit profile and all that, it, it just makes, it makes sense. It's, it's increasingly relationship based pricing. Um, and it, it just, it remains very, very stable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, and before we part, I, I just, uh, uh, I made the comment earlier that the volume probably is impacted by, by SOFA amendments, but this number is not. And I think, I think everybody listening should just take a take a thought on what's happening to the overall size of the market portfolio. That's on slide 27. Right. Um, so uh, for for listeners, the, the slide shows um, uh, two charts. Uh, the left hand chart shows outstanding ABL loan commitments. So it shows commitments that are active in the market and just over time. So we have seen um, an increase in the number of commitments or the volume of commitments um, over the last two quarters. In, um, in, at the end of uh, the second quarter, we were at a record 319 billion of ABL commitments. Um, and in the third quarter, we moved up and we're actually at 333 billion, which um, you know, clearly outpaced the the, the prior record. Um, I think that what's really interesting in this chart is apart from the fact that maturing volume has um, been pushed out, um, over 230 billion of ABL commitments. So over 72% of the outstanding commitments have been issued over the last 18 months. So we've seen the growth of um, uh, capacity that has been allocated to ABL, in all likelihood, some of that may slow down because such a large proportion of the market has been refinanced over the last 18 months, but it's it's definitely quite large. Yep, yep. And I, I guess if we're going to get to the predictions uh, category, this is why I, I think that volume probably will will soften is that so much of the market has locked in five-year, uh, generally, uh, you know, attractive pricing to take advantage of their upsized inventory. If you believe that that inflation will ultimately uh, uh, re go down, that inventory levels because of supply chain and inflation will go down, and that borrowers won't want to pay a higher spread for the same money, I would think that they'll just stay with what they've got uh, for for a little while here. And that the, the 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 quarterly volume should drop. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that the opportunity for new um, issuance, incremental issuance, might come from borrowers who maybe had moved away or had focused on cash flow lending for a long time, and now suddenly in these new um, economic in this new economic environment, they might revisit or visit um, ABL lending for the first time if they have, again, sort of the assets that allow them to do um, to do so. But I don't think that anybody who is an ABL borrower that that doesn't need to return to the market is incentivized to return to the market in you know the next um, year or so, definitely. Um. Before we part, uh, CJ, Maria, any any more predictions? Any more? Uh, if you look into Q4 or into 2023, what are you what are you predicting? So we when we get back together again, we can say how we missed it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a tough question. I, I'd say from my perspective, you know, I just I guess you know fourth quarter expect volume to be down as as I mentioned earlier, and um, you know it, it's kind of hard to, to call in some ways, but. I would just say as well, like a focus on, you know, existing portfolios, you know, uh, really monitoring how the, um, the highly levered uh, companies are performing and, you know, um, and, and taking action where needed there. So I, I'd say a lot of uh, por portfolio monitoring activity. Well, um, thank you both for joining. This was lots of data, lots of insight, and uh, I look forward to to meeting again in, in a quarter and figure out if we if we were right or not. And even if we weren't, we'll get together. So thanks again. Thank you so Great. much. Thanks a lot. Well, an excellent discussion with Maria DeCaos and CJ Doherty from Refinitiv. 
on what is a very complex uh, environment for loans and bonds and private debt and ABL and everything in between. So really encourage you to uh, download the presentation, take a look at it, uh, listen to our discussion. But And I don't want to restate it all, but I think there were a couple of real highlight points. First of all, there's a distinct slowdown in leveraged lending and the bond market due to the very uh, obvious economic factors. But in the third quarter, it really, it really became noticeable. And I would say markets capitulated a bit after having some optimism. Uh, there's, there's just a, a, real, a real drop off in activity and, and, and flow. Uh, the direct lending has filled the gap, uh, second point, uh, to a large extent and had a fantastic year. But even there towards the end of the third quarter, and as CJ pointed out, his expectation is you'll see it more in Q4, the relative value concerns and also just con concerns about raising additional liquidity uh, making capital very tight are definitely impacting the direct lending market and probably have more impact in, in upcoming quarters. And with respect to ABL, uh, and Maria covered it very well, uh, record pace for the year uh, and, and uh, hard to say exactly how that continues into Q4, but uh, it's, been a, it's been a phenomenal first three quarters and really a, a just a perfect, a perfect year for asset-based lenders. Greater uh, opportunity to increase facilities for existing borrowers increased usage and still fairly benign credit costs. And I think behind that, and it doesn't really show up in the numbers, but Maria covered it, uh, expectation is that banks will be more cautious and monitor their capital more carefully. And so I think it'll start to show up in, in Q4. And we, we all expect that the volume for the, from the ABL market probably drops in upcoming quarters, simply because so much of the market has refinanced their, their deal at attractive terms and pricing. Uh, over the last 18 months that it, it wouldn't be surprising to see it take a bit of a break. I want to thank uh, Maria and CJ for joining me on the podcast. Thanks so much again to SFNet for their partnership on the podcast series and special thanks to Hilco Global for their sponsorship of the SFNet Presents In The Know podcast series. I hope you like the podcast and I always welcome your feedback.